everybody for coming. Good afternoon, Wichita Falls. This is Henry Florsham. I am the president and CEO of the Wichita Falls Chamber of Commerce. Next Tuesday, the citizens of Wichita Falls have a chance to make the boldest statement I think we could make in, in years in terms of the future of our community, and that is to build two new high schools for the school district. Here today, we've got the president of the Board of Trustees of WFISD, Elizabeth Yeager, and Superintendent Mike Kurt. They will be sharing a presentation with us and you'll have a chance to, to ask questions using the Q&A feature. As we go through the presentation, they may stop to address some of those questions. And once they get done with the presentation, we will go to the Q&A and make sure that we address all the rest of your questions. If it takes us past three o'clock, we'll all stick around until we get all of your questions answered. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Elizabeth and Mike. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Henry, and thanks to everybody for joining us today. We're excited to share uh, more details about the bond propositions that are on the ballot right now um, with the election on November 3rd, next Tuesday. So I'll start the presentation out and then Mr. Kurt will finish up. And as Henry said, we'd be happy to answer questions uh, throughout and also at the end. So what you see on the ballot is two propositions that will allow us to move forward with the creation and building of two new high schools in Wichita Falls. But this is really part of a bigger plan that we are calling creating a vision for the future of WFISD. And, and this is step one of a long range plan that will allow us to address our facilities needs throughout the district over the next 15 to 25 years. We started this process a few years ago by bringing in, in um, community members, students, staff, um, administrators to help us define what our core beliefs and goals are. And I won't read all of these, but there are a couple of themes that kind of run through the entire work that we've been doing over the past couple of years. One is that um, everyone in our district deserves the resources that they need to be successful. One of the key facts, uh, key um, factors throughout our process was to make sure that we're giving all of our students equal opportunities. And you'll see that in the design of the these two high schools when Mr. Kurt talks about those in more detail. It's also really important that the community is involved in public education. Public education is not just the purview of those of us involved in it on a day-to-day -day basis, but we need to be intimately working with the community to make sure that our graduates are gaining the skills that they need to be successful citizens of Wichita Falls once they leave our public education system. Our goals follow along with that and a couple of things that are also kind of a recurring theme throughout this um, proposal is that we want students to be to engage in meaningful and relevant learning experiences in a collaborative way and we want them to be in an environment that creates increased engagement. We've learned a lot about modern school facilities uh, with the um, bringing on of the Career Education Center. As many of you know, that facility opened in 2017 after the successful bond election of 2015. That building has been extraordinarily successful in allowing us to provide programs and uh, opportunities to our high school students. At any given time, we have over 500 students attending classes there, and they're able to take advantage of a modern school facility that has flexible spaces that allow our students to learn in, in different areas, in different ways than they learn in a traditional classroom. You can see those pictures on the left where we have the learning stair that opens up uh, to a flex space on the bottom picture there. Um, that is, can be a closed room or open up to become part of the main hallway and part of the area that includes the learning stairs. So we've, we've been able to utilize that facility in ways that we can't utilize other facilities in the district. And it's shown us a lot about how flexible spaces really do make the learning environment a lot more conducive to what we're trying to do in the 21st century. The programs that we have at the Career Education Center were developed with significant community input and we wanted to make sure that the programs are producing graduates with skill sets that are useful here in our local economy. And those include health and medical, engineering, information technology, criminal justice, construction technology, automotive, etc. 
I mentioned flexibility and I like to think about how I learned as a student when I was going through uh, public school here in Wichita Falls. And a lot of my education was sitting in, in rows of desks with my teacher in front of me delivering content from a chalkboard or an overhead projector. That's changed a lot today. And we see our students learning in a lot of different ways. They may sit in rows and they may receive content in a more traditional way, but more often than, they're not, than not, they're working in small groups, collaborating with each other and with their teacher. They're learning in different spaces and they need flexible seating with technology available no matter where they are within the classroom or within the, the campus. So we've spent a great deal of time over the past five or six years listening to this community and making sure that we are aligning our goals with the community's goals to create learning opportunities for our students that meet the needs not just of our students today but of our students in the 22nd century and so flexibility is a key part of that we don't know exactly what education will look like in the 22nd century we know it's changing rapidly and whatever we do in terms of our facilities we want to make sure that we have flexible spaces that will meet the needs of our students for quite some time. So I'll talk briefly about how we got to the point we're at today. In 2018, we commissioned Bundy, Young, Sims and Potter to um, do a capital improvement study for us and they had, uh, researched and went to each campus within the district and identified the capital improvement needs at all campuses. Life cycle maintenance items only. This is not renovations or additions, uh, not new paint or anything to make things look better, but strictly replacing those life cycle systems like HVAC, plumbing, roofing, and electrical systems. As you can see, that's a significant uh, portion uh, of $170 million, a significant um, expense that we have for capital improvements over the next 10 years. And our annual maintenance budget as a frame of reference is about 10 to $12 million a year. And about 1.4 million of that is allocated every year to go toward these capital improvement costs. So as you can see, it's very difficult for us to catch up with the capital improvement needs that we have in the district with our existing budget unless we go to the taxpayers and ask for additional funding to help us meet some of those needs. In January of 2019, we conducted a thought exchange, which is an online conversation with nearly a thousand people participating and sharing with us their ideas and thoughts on the district. We convened a long range facility planning committee that, that February and they met throughout the spring gathering input from the community through four community open forums that were held at our three high schools and the Career Education Center. And then they continued to meet and developed uh, a list of options that they presented to the Board of Trustees in May of 2019. The district has worked uh, very hard since May of 2019 to develop a long range facility plan that takes into account all of the input that we've gathered from the capital improvement study, the thought exchange, the open forums, and the ideas that were generated by the long range facility planning committee. So what is the long range plan? Briefly, um, three key components. The current, the 2020 bond election, which is the one on the ballot right now, which would allow us to build two new high schools and start the process of renovating, retiring or building new schools throughout WFISD. 2027 would see us hold another bond election, which would allow us to move on to renovate middle schools and some other projects, including the building of a new elementary school. And then in 2035, we would see a second, a third bond election to fund additional projects. A key point of those 2027 and 2035 dates, they are very specific for a reason. In 2027, we have bond debt rolling off. Um, that, that debt was incurred with the building of Southern Hills and Scotland Park Elementary Schools. Um, and in 2035, the debt from the building of the Career Education Center will be paid off. And so we would be able at those points to go back to the voters and ask for a no tax increased bond election uh, to allow us to continue to maintain the tax rate at the 2020 rate and continue to utilize those funds to renovate uh, the rest of the campuses throughout WFISD. 
this current proposal, which would build two new high schools, would basically re-envision the way we uh, do high school in Wichita Falls ISD, moving us from a three high school system to a two high school system. So we would see the retirement of Wichita Falls High School, which is about 100 years old, and the retirement of Ryder High School and Hershey High School. Those two facilities, which were built in the early 60s, would be repurposed as middle schools. Ryder would be repurposed as a middle school and Hershey as a middle school. So we'd see students from McNeil move into Ryder and students from Kirby move into Hershey. We do some minor renovations to those two facilities because we need them to last for a little longer. Um, believe it or not, they are some of our newer buildings in Wichita Falls ISD. So there is useful life left in them and we hope to continue to utilize them for several decades as middle schools. Another factor in this is with the repurposing of Ryder as a middle school, we would move the McNeil students out of that facility, repurpose it as an elementary school, which would allow us to move Jefferson students to McNeil and close Jefferson Elementary, which is one of our uh, buildings in, in poor condition. And we would also be able to alleviate some of the overcrowding that we see in our elementary schools in the southwest side of town, specifically Fowler and West Foundation. In August, the Board of Trustees uh, unanimously voted to hold a bond election, and there will be two propositions on the ballot totaling $290 million. And again, these propositions would allow us to, to start the process of uh, working this long range facility plan by building two new high schools and starting that domino effect, allowing us to upgrade the facilities throughout Wichita Falls ISD. So I'll turn it over now to Mr. Kurt and he'll talk in more detail about what is proposed. Thank you, Ms. Shager. Thank you very much for uh, um, your time today, everybody. Um, the propositions um, is probably the most confusing part of this bond election. Why are there two propositions? And it's pretty simple. So come on computer all right proposition a gets us land and a building two different sites proposition b gets us the practice facilities that go along with these why are there two different propositions several years ago about the 13 or so legislative session um, the legislature said um, these school districts that are out there and have big propositions on ballots in which they have new schools and um, massive outdoor um, stadiums or performing arts facilities or administration complexes. Um, they said you can't ask the voters who might want to build a school but don't want to have this big performing arts center or don't want to have a big stadium. Those have to be on separate ballots, which I can agree with that and I don't, I don't have any issue with that concept. But what happened was in the details, um, it's got all, it got all messed up. <laughs> so. Anything not connected to this school right here has to be on a separate proposition now. So these are practice fields. These aren't stadiums. These aren't um, competition fields where you're gonna have thousands of people um, there. These are practice fields that we'd have at every one of our high schools right now. Um, we do play tennis at our high schools and so you would be able to have tennis matches here. We would at this, um, at this field right here on both of these sites, we would be able to have like freshman or JV games because they can't seat more than a thousand people. And I think these are designed to seat about 750 people. So you could have events here, but they're small events and they're mainly made for practice facilities um, throughout, I mean, for these two facilities. We would still have Memorial Stadium. We would still have Hoskins Field and Sunrise Optimist and things like that um, for varsity events. Um, these would just be practice facilities. So therefore, the two propositions, Proposition A gets us a school and lands, Proposition B, the, the practice facilities to go along with um, those two schools. If one, of the, if, one of the if one or the other would pass and not the other one, we wouldn't have a complete project. In other words, if Proposition A passed, um, we would not, and Proposition B did not, we'd have a school and land, but we wouldn't have practice fields to go with it. Same thing with Proposition B. If it passed, we'd really have nothing because we wouldn't have land to build it on or a school to go with it. So, uh, so these are two separate propositions um, that, that are required to make this bond work the way uh, it's being proposed. 
these two sites, which are here um, on your screen. The left side is the east site, and the right side is the, is the west site. The east side is located at the intersection of 287 and 281. Um, Castaway Cove is right up here. The clinics in North Texas is right down here. This road right here is Brewster, and it would go all the way to the CEC down here a little bit further. This is a 180 acre plus piece of land um, right here, more than we need for a school, um, but we wanted to control um, the, the line of sight all along this road right here because a couple things, when we think about these schools and where they're located and, uh, and why we have two schools, the boards had several um, um, ideals for, for the last five or six years at least. Um, we wanted to have, first off, a facility where um, you can see it driving through town. We want to have uh, um, a Jacksboro, a Justin Northwest, Decatur, Alvor, Bory, Bowie, um, Iowa Park. Um, all of those, you, you, can, you can picture their schools because when you drive through those communities, you see those schools. And we wanted uh, schools on a um, major thoroughfare going through town. So with that, um, here are major thoroughfares going through town. And so an east campus and a west campus. So that was essential. Let me go back. We need a 100 acre piece of land. Inside this loop right here is about 85 acres. Inside right here is about 85 acres. And so we needed 100 acres really because anytime you replace a permeable surface with an impermeable surface, anytime you replace grass with concrete, you have to have drainage um, um, detention ponds to catch the drainage. And so both of these have to have these detention ponds to go along with them. So um, therefore, we really needed more than 85 acres. Our goal was 100 acres. The east side is 180 acres, and the west side is 105 acres. The west side is located on Kell Boulevard. Here's where Seymour Highway comes into Kell. Southwest Parkway comes in down here, and FN 369 um, is right here. There's a Tiger Mart located right here off of Kell Boulevard. So sites for 100 acres, sites that had high visibility from the community, sites that had easy access. Right here on the, on the east site, if you're exiting Winthorpe Road off 287, you'll turn down here and into the facility. If you're exiting, if you take 281 and exit Midwestern Parkway, you can take, make the U-turn there and get on the access road to enter the facility. You could go straight on Midwestern Parkway to get onto here. It's pretty easy. And if you're exiting here, um, you can go up here and take this U-turn um, right over here. Um, that's pretty easy whenever you get right up here to this road to go right across the road right here. And, uh, um, and then again, depending upon if you're going south or not, right now, Winthorpe Road continues on. Midwestern Parkway does not, but they have a lot of access to these facilities from a lot of different areas. Same thing on the west side, Seymour Highway comes in here. You stay on the feeder road to get into the facility. If you exit Kell back here to get onto Seymour or the Seymour Road exit, um, you can do the same thing. Um, if you're coming from the um, north or the west, the same thing. And then when you leave both, when you leave this facility, there's a U-turn right here um, that easily puts you back onto Kell. So access was a, was a big issue for the facilities um, that we wanted as well. Also, um, location was important. I said the west site's 105 acres. The east site is 180 plus acres. There was a site up here on the north side of town, right here south of Cracker Barrel. It's 80 acres. So it's not quite 85, and so that we'd have to change the setup that we have. Um, and so that was kind of limiting. It's really hard access to this facility. Um, you're really your only way to get to it would be uh, um, to either take the Iowa Park Road and exit there off Beverly and come back around or go all the way up to Walmart and come back around to get to that facility. It's really not an easy way to get to and from that facility. Also price, and I'm gonna talk about price more so in a little bit about why that was a sticking point for us, but this 105 acres over here on the west side of town was $1.95 million. So we have an option contract to purchase this site should the, um, should the bond pass this site right here. 
This site over on the east side of town, 180 plus acres, it's $4.2 million. This site, again, an option contract to purchase that land. This site up here for this 80 acres, um, the asking price is $17.4 million. So that's way out of our price range um, as far as um, purchasing land. And I'll talk about why um, that is important more so in a minute. Also, okay, so we have location, easy access, to and from the facilities, high visibility, density of students. This is a map of our student density. Hershey students here in gray, Wichita Falls High School students in green, and um, Ryder students in blue. Um, you'll see that our dense population of our students really starts around Scotland Park, goes past Zundee down to Crockett, and then down through here you get Cunningham, Milam, Fane, Lamar, Southern Hills, um, this is our densest population in town. The growing part of town is over here on the west side of town, southwest side of town, West Foundation, Jefferson, and Fowler. And there are decreasing populations up here on the northeast side of town primarily. So density had a lot to do with this as well. Um, where are all of our students located? You can see the two sites, um, kind of our bookends where most of our students are located. Socioeconomically disadvantaged students. This chart shows the purple are um, free lunch students. So um, they qualify for free lunch. The red dots qualify for, for reduced price lunches. And the yellow dots are students that are full pay. And so you'll notice that our densest population of free and reduced price students are way down here also. And you'll notice that there's quite a few down here on the southwest side of town, which I, I'm sure some of you might not know that. Um, why is that? East of McNeil, which is right over here, there are six low-income housing units that have been built over the last several years on the southwest side of town. So a lot of the migration, we're not growing as a community, but we're shifting. And a lot of the migration from the northeast side of town has shifted down here to the southwest side of town because of available, affordable housing. Um, that's down here. So from, uh, um, again, these are the two sites that kind of book in where the most of our students are located. Okay, and the last one was equal. Our board wanted equal schools where all of our students have the same opportunities. Our students that currently attend Hershey High School have less opportunities than our students that attend Wichita Falls High School, and they have less opportunities than students that attend Ryder High School. And why is that? Well, Wichita Falls High School, I mean, Ryder High School is 1,600 students. Wichita Falls High School is right at 1,200 students, and Hershey's um, right at 900 students. Purely size has a lot to do with it. When you have more students, you can offer more opportunities. Larger programs, more classes make, things like that whenever you have larger schools. So 1,600 compared to 900 is important. Also, demographics of the students that attend. If you've been a part of a booster club or a PTA or a PTO, um, demographics and the, the um, economic level or the wealth level of the parents that attend the school have a lot to do with it. When you have wealthier parents, you have better participation in such events. And you can see that most of the parents that are in yellow are in the rider zone. There are very few parents in the old high zone. Um, that are yellow and very few um, also in the um, Hershey zone. And so those two big factors have a lot to do with this. We have an imaginary line right here. That's red, you can see it going through here. If you go from Fairway, up Fairway from Lake Wichita, up Fairway to Kell, down Kell to I-44, up I-44 to the top of our district. Everybody west and north of this line if they attended the West Campus and everybody south and east of this line attended the East Campus, we would have two campuses with a little bit more than 1,800 students per campus and the same number of economically disadvantaged students, white students, Hispanic students, and African American students within three to five percentage points. So basically we would have two equal campuses, same size, same wealth level um, between the two campuses. That is, that is a big deal um, for our board um, throughout this process was to kind of come up with as much as we could to make equal opportunities for students. And Ms. Yeager mentioned that 
um, whenever she started earlier. So that's where the campuses are. I'm gonna show you this video real quick to kind of give you a summarization of, uh, um, of what we're proposing from a facility standpoint. Oops, that didn't work. <laughs> Okay, so um, this presentation is called um, Creating a Vision for the Future, and that's what that was. That was a vision. Um, that is architectural renderings of, uh, um, of the proposed campus. And, um, and we're talking two equal campuses, West Campus, I mean East Campus. I'll do that again, West Campus, East Campus. And so um, it doesn't exist. Um, and the, the bond would have to pass in order to have these. So it truly is a vision um, for the future um, of the district and, and what it might look like. Again, just renderings of the East and West campus. So this is a different learning space than what we have at our current campuses. Right now we have, uh, um, we do have classrooms. Don't worry, there are classrooms involved in these buildings and they are, um, um, out there on, on the edge of the building. But right through the center of this building is a learning space that if you've been to the CEC, is three times longer and three times wider than the one at the CEC. So this is a pretty massive space. As we, as Ms. Yeager mentioned earlier, um, the idea of, of, of schools ready for the 22nd century, ready for all the changes that are gonna happen over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years in education. We need flexibility. Um, we need opportunities for students for collaboration um, and online learning opportunities. Right now, 275 of our students take dual credit classes at MSU and Vernon, and they're all virtual. In other words, no one meets face-to-face -face with our um, dual credit classes. And so right now, those students go home because we don't have spaces like this in our current facilities for students to be in their small groups with other people taking these classes and, um, and have the opportunity to, to, to sit in an area and, uh, um, and, and learn with your peers. We, just, we envision a different reality for learning. Um, the goal right now is in the next year to have designed uh, sorry, junior and senior level courses for our students to take online or face-to-face. -face. In other words, if you're taking English for you can choose to take that face-to-face -face with a teacher or you can take an online version of that, strictly online. And if you've taken a college course online, you know what that's like. That is not the same as a, um, as a synchronous course that we're doing right now. This would be a completely online course. And we're gonna create those um, in anticipation of a future where students are, want those options. Students want flexibility in their schedule. That's the biggest thing we get from juniors and seniors that have cars or have jobs is they need flexibility in their schedules. And so creating that environment on our campuses where they can be at school, taking their online classes during the day, before school, after school, in these learning spaces um, is, is essential. <clears throat> 
this is a, um, you saw the gymnasium. This is a 1900 seat auditorium, uh, 1900 seat gymnasium. Um, please don't get hung up on the Navy. This is just a color we don't use right now. So therefore, um, we chose Navy. If we chose another color, someone might have a problem with that. Um, but this is just an option um, for what that um, gymnasium might look like. This is a 500 seat auditorium. Both campuses have these. The coolest thing about these is these are gonna be unique um, to only us. These are actually, this is actually six classrooms. Three on the bottom story, one right here, one right here, and one right here. You can see the dividing lines or partitions here. And then three on the second story of the building, one up here, two right here, and three here. A wall divides all of this. All these bleachers are electronic. They fold back into the wall. These walls are all electronic and they compress into these side walls. And so you could have a 200 seat, 250 seat auditorium right here and leave the back closed off or open the whole thing up to have a, a 500 seat auditorium. To give you an idea of how big this is, the current auditorium at Ryder is about 415 seats. So this is larger than the auditorium at Ryder. The stage is bigger than the stage at Old High. Um, the stage at Old High, um, even though it is a large stage, it's not a full UIL regulation stage. It's not deep enough. And so this stage is uh, um, pretty deep um, as far as that goes. And I think I have a floor plan kind of a showing you this. Um, this is a floor plan of the school. Again, classroom spaces, that learning um, commons area, fine arts area. Here's the auditorium and then um, athletic areas. We have the ability to add on to these facilities, classroom spaces here on both the first and second floor, a, a indoor practice facility, if uh, the district so chooses in the future to do that, or a, uh, um, or a larger auditorium if we chose, so choose to do that. And I'll, I'll tell you to why we have not done that um, to this point in just a minute. This is a, um, a little close up of the athletic area, proposed area. Right here, one of these practice gyms, has restrooms in it, has different ventilation system and electricity going to it. And this is required tornado shelter that has to be in these facilities. So, um, and, and everybody in the facility has to be able to be in here for a period of time. So both of these have the required tornado shelters. Right here is that stage I was talking about. Again, six classrooms. If you think of six standard 800 square foot classrooms, Here's three on the first floor, here's three on the second floor, and again, all these walls collapse and the bleachers fold out to make this auditorium space um, in the facility. And why is that important? Well, oh yeah, don't forget about Proposition B. Proposition B is the, is the, is the um, practice fields that go, that go with these um, facilities, not just the facilities themselves. Well, it's taxes. It's funding capacity. Um, having a school, um, bond election increases this bucket, our INS tax rate. Our INS tax rate pays for our mortgage payment. This is, this is voter approved and 100% local voter funded, INS taxes are. Maintenance and operations taxes are made up of local taxes and state taxes. Um, they both come in to fund this one. But this one's the easy one as far as understanding it. The mortgage payment that we have right now, and Ms. Yeager briefly mentioned that, is Southern Hills, Scotland Park, all the gymnasiums that were added across the district back then, the addition of Milam, all those things happened um, with the 06 bond. And then in 15, we had the CEC, the additions to Barwise and the additions to McNeil. And that was, that was what was approved. And so therefore that's our mortgage and what we have to make that mortgage payment and can only be used for that. It can't be used for anything else. This is our state funds, state, um, taxes plus local taxes, and 85% of this bucket is salaries. And we use the other 15% for utilities, supplies, repairs, fuels, and renovations, HVAC, roofing technology, all of that comes out of this bucket. This bucket can pour into here, but this bucket cannot pour into here based on state laws. So this INS tax rate is capped at 50 cents. Right now, our MO budget is 96.64 cents. Our INS budget is 18 cents for a total tax rate of $1.1464. If you've received your um, tax statement um, in the mail, you will see WFISD school taxes at $1.1464. Our INS mortgage payment is 18 cents. You'll see these other districts around us have higher um, INS rates than we do. 
And the reason they have higher tax rates than we do is they've spent, they've had bond elections and authorized school funding or authorized capital improvements to their schools to a more significant amount, um, not a necessarily total dollar amount, but compared to their population than we have. And that's over the last 20 or so years that they've authorized these. Burke, Iowa Park, City View, Holiday, Archer. At the same time, others have also. Waco, Victoria, Abilene, um, Tyler, same thing. They've authorized bond elections, and they're similar to us as far as big cities go. Um, we're capped at 50 cents. This 18 cents can only go up to 50 cents. Just in Northwest, um, or Northwest ISD, which is from, say, Rome to um, Bonds Ranch Road, all the way around to the racetrack, Bucky's and all of that, that's all just in Northwest ISD. Their total tax rates $1.14663, which our proposal on this bond election would take our tax rate to $1.14664, um, is adding 32 cents to this 18 cents for a total of 50 cents. Why is that? We can't go higher than 50 cents and it takes 32 cents for us to get $290 million. The price of these two facilities is $290 million. Like Ms. Yeager said earlier, this bond election now, building these two schools, starts the dominoes falling um, for our long range plan. In 2027, if the voters approve that bond election, we would basically be reauthorizing the taxes that roll off the pennies, that roll off the tax rate as a result of Scotland Park and Southern Hills being paid off and keep the tax rate at $1.14664. In 2035, the same thing would happen. The taxes that were used to build the CEC and the Barwise and McNeil additions would be then spent, would be, if they're reauthorized, keeping the tax rate at $1.4664 um, and then you reauthorize those dollars to do more um, facilities at that point. So this 32 cent tax increase, which basically takes our tax rate then to $1.4664, way up here, almost $1.47. It takes our INS tax rate from 18 cents up to 50 cents. And our 9664 stays the same. It cannot change, it's legislatively capped also. So the legislature would have to change that tax rate and then um, our voters cannot approve any more taxes um, for WFISD related to INS until we pay some off. And again, that happens in 2027 and again in 2035. And so what does that do for us? Um, that gets us then two new high schools this time. It allows us to move Hershey and, and McNeil into Ryder and Old High. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, Kirby and McNeil into Ryder and Old High. Jefferson into McNeil, overflow from West and Fowler into McNeil as well. Um, and then in 2027, if that bond would pass, we would consider building a North Elementary somewhere, add on to West Foundation, add on to Scotland Park, renovate um, Booker T. Washington, retire Crockett, retire Zundi, retire Burgess, retire um, Lamar, um, renovations to Haynes Elementary. And then in 2035, we would then build a new South Elementary, add on to Southern Hills, add on to the new part of Milam, tear down the old part of Milam, add on to the new part of Cunningham, tear down the old part of Cunningham, um, and, uh, um, and retire Fane, retire Franklin. Jefferson would have already been retired. Um, so by 2039, somewhere in there, about 20, 20 years from now, every building in the district would have been renovated, added on to, um, retired, or we'd have new facilities. Um, and everything would be then touched in the district. We didn't get here overnight. We can't fix it overnight. We're capped at 50 cents, so it would take us that long. Um, in 2027, um, also the big um, expense there is renovating Hershey, Barwise, and Ryder. Like Ms. Jaeger said, those are some of our newer facilities. They've got to last us 30 more years. If they last us 30 more years, 
in 2050 when this bond election would be paid off to build these two new high schools in 2050 bar wise would be over 100 years old and Ryder and hershey would both be over 90 years old just like wichita falls is now and uh the voters could then consider in 2050 a bond to replace those middle schools but those have got to last us for um, quite a while still so the uh, math on this real quick and i'll wrap this up 32 cents um is the tax is a proposed tax increase on a hundred thousand dollar house that's about 26 dollars a month you'll also see in your tax statement a twenty five thousand dollar homestead exemption so everybody has that on their homestead so in reality if you have a hundred thousand dollar house you're only going to pay taxes on seventy five thousand of it and so this increase would be about twenty dollars a month two hundred thousand dollar house you'd add 26 to it so it'd be 46 dollars a month a $300,000 house, you'd add another twenty-six to it, it'd be $74 a month. If you have a $400,000 house, you'd add another $26 to it, it'd be $100 a month increase in your taxes based on this $0.32 cent tax increase. Unless you're over, over 65, if you're over 65, your taxes have been frozen. They would not increase. If you currently pay $3,000 in taxes, after this bond election, if it would pass, you'd still pay $3,000 in taxes. The only way that goes up is if you have an addition, a significant improvement to your house. You build a pool, um, a detached garage, something like that. And then that new addition would be valued at the new rate and you take your old rate plus the new rate and create a blended rate. And that's how your taxes would then be figured um, on that. Voting's already started. I guess everybody knows that. And uh, um, if you have questions or want to, uh, um, Submit those versus ask them. You can definitely do that online um, at this website. And all the information that we just talked about, all the facts, there's a one pager, are here as well. So with that, I'm uh, um, I'm going to leave my screen up for a little bit um, in case I need to refer to another set of slides. Um, but we'll uh, start taking questions or, or answering questions. Mike and Elizabeth, thank you very much. And, and I know that some of these questions have been answered as you went through the presentation. Of course, some people have joined since we started and may have missed it. So we'll go through a few of these and uh, you can either refer back to a slide or just answer it. So I'm, I'm gonna ask these in no particular order. I see one about the board. Is the board unified with this proposal? Can you talk to us about the process the board went through and then how the vote went? Mike, do you want to start or do you want me to? No, you go ahead. You're the board. Okay. Um, we, throughout the process, have had open discussions, clearly. We, we do that. Um, about the proposals um, in quite a bit of detail, and this started in 2019, June of 2019, where we started talking about the long-range plan in detail. And I will say the first conversation that we had um, or several months of conversations was about how many high schools do we need. Um, and we developed a consensus around two high schools feeling as though that was the best use of resources in WFISD in terms of how we could provide opportunities to students in a fair manner uh, without spreading our resources too, th too thinly. Um, and also, as Mr. Kurt spent quite a bit of time talking about, we wanted to make sure we had equitable opportunities for our students. And we felt like two high schools was a way to go with that. And also create or, or continue to have some of the competition that we enjoy in Wichita Falls between our high schools. Um, we felt like that was important to continue that tradition as well. So um, we worked for a number of months over a year and voted unanimously in August to bring these propositions forward to the public. Thank you, Elizabeth. There were a couple of questions about the transfer policy. There was a concern issued about athlete, athletic disparity because people would transfer into the district they wanted to play sports in. Can y'all address the transfer policy between East and West campuses? Um, Mike, I'll, I'll start if that's okay and let you finish with detailed policy information. Um, we've worked hard on the board over the past several years to um, change the way we allow transfers within the district. I know it's not perfect, but the goal with um, 
especially with the locations of these two new schools and the way we're able to draw boundaries is to limit transfers. Um, one specific reason I would see a student being able to transfer would be to attend the IB program, which would be offered at one campus. So students who were zoned to say the West campus, but wanted to participate in IB would be allowed to transfer to the East campus, for example. Um, Transfers, there are reasons that students transfer that go beyond just personal preferences and those have to do with, with personal issues like bullying and things like that. And we have to allow transfers of that nature. But I, I can't speak for a future board, but I think the goal is to minimize transfers. And so uh, another reason we have transfers in the district is district-wide special ed programs. Um, we have certain campuses house our autism programs, certain campuses how's the behavior program, some another campus houses the life skills program. And so um, these schools would, would have all of those programs on both campuses. And so therefore there would not be a specific program at a school outside of the IB program where students would have a need to transfer. So yes, um, I think uh, um, that, um, that goal um, that Ms. Yeager talked about is, is, to, is to not have that. Um, you, you'd be zoned to your campus and, uh, um, and that's where you would have to stay. We've had a couple of questions about the names of the new schools. Can you, can you go over again the process you would go through to name those schools? Yeah. So uh, um, the, the way this would work is at least <laughs> um, Mike's thoughts on that plan. Nothing has been decided by the board. Um, but my thoughts on that is during the 22-23 school year, we would... Um, name principals to these two schools. And then the principals would sit down with the available teachers we have and say, okay, here are the science teachers. You get one, I get one. You get one, I get one. I need a physics, you get a physics. That type thing, we would divide up the teachers for these two schools. And then those two staffs would then spend the 22, 23 school, I mean the 23, 24 school year planning these schools. In other words, Everything gets done as far as scheduling goes and, and, and all the rest of that. During that time also, um, the board will have already drawn lines um, as far as exactly where that boundary line is gonna be to make these schools as equal as possible. And then um, we would allow those staff um, to then come up with um, ways to assess colors, mascots, um, things like that for these names of these schools. And so student input, community input, obviously the board has to decide, the board approves it, um, the final names of the schools and mascots and all that stuff. Um, but um, my conversations with the board, they don't have a big appetite at all for having, uh, um, having that be on their shoulders. Um, they, they, they want a lot of input from people. And, and so I think, uh, Voting by students on colors and names and all that is, uh, um, is definitely part of the process for the future. There were a couple of questions about what happens to the existing high school facilities. Can you just uh, refresh the audience on those three real quick? Okay, so uh, um, Hershey and Ryder, um, which are I think the seventh and eighth newest facilities in the district um, would be renovated. Um, just a little bit. They, they'd have some touch-up done in 2020, and then they're proposed to have big renovations in 2027 because they need to last us about 30 more years. And, uh, um, and then Wichita Falls High School would be retired as an educational facility. We're not demolishing the building at this time because over the next 10 years, maybe 20 years, depending upon where we build schools and what school gets renovated when, we might want to use Wichita Falls High School as a temporary facility. If Barwise has a big renovation, um, those students have to move out of Barwise um, in order to have that done. Maybe they move into Wichita Falls High School for a year or two while that happens. And when we're building a new elementary school on the north or south side of town, depending upon um, land availability and where that elementary would go, um, there'd be an opportunity to move students out of, out of a site if we tear down their site in order to build an elementary school somewhere. Or an elementary school um, could go on the site of Wichita Falls High School if that building was no longer there. Remind the group what happens if only one bond passes. <laughs> okay, so uh, um, if bond A passes, 
we would have proposition a we would have land the opportunity to buy land to build those two schools and build the two campuses um, we would not have practice facilities to go along with them about 13 million dollars worth of practice facilities on the two sites and so therefore i would assume then that the board would go back out for another bond election over the next couple of years to try to get that approved so that way there is um, there are practice facilities on those sites if proposition b would pass and proposition a would not pass um, nothing would happen because we would be authorized 13 million dollars to build practice facilities for two schools that would not exist and so basically that's just that doesn't happen um, then we if, if we kept um, the same plan um, and the board chose to go back out for another bond election for those two same facilities um, somewhere else at a different time just because timing was an issue um, then that would be a possibility but um, that 13 million would be authorized for practice facilities attached to these two schools so we wouldn't have any schools um, at that time to the audience if we have not answered your question yet please type it otherwise this will be the last question patricia just posted with COVID-19 still looming, how do you feel it's right to put more burden on an already burdened society? Well, okay. my answer to that is, um, if not now, when are we going to do this? Um, the, the, if this bond, bond passes, if these propositions pass next week, uh, the tax rate won't go up until October, um, or well, actually 2020, what One. year is it? 2021. So, um, we hope by then, you know, there'll be some some significant economic recovery and there'll be the, the light at the end of the tunnel be well within view in terms of COVID. So um, I think the point for the board is that there's never a perfect time for a tax increase or a bond proposal. And so we just, we've got a plan ready. We, we think this is the right time for Wichita Falls despite COVID and we just have to let the voters make that decision for us. Yeah, and I, I just don't, I, I don't agree with the already burdened society um, comment. Um, we do have, we do have issues and we always have issues um, in, in our community, in our district and everything else. And so I don't think this is, um, COVID is, is tough and, and, and we're dealing with it. Um, and I think our school district has dealt with it really well. Um, and, and I think we're, we're positioned, we've positioned ourselves to, uh, um, to come out of this stronger than we were. We've increased our ability to offer online instruction to students. Um, our, our teacher capacity related to online and technology um, driven instruction um, has been enhanced tremendously. And so uh, um, I think we're poised and ready for the future. And so I, I don't know that, that this increases a burden. I think uh, um, taxes are always um, part of the problem and, and part of the solution. And, uh, um, and, and, if they, and if we look at them as a solution moving forward um, and the opportunities that, that a $290 million influx of, of funds into this community um, does for our businesses and for our construction trades and, and um, housing and everything like that, um, I, I think there's, it, it, it's an opportunity, not necessarily a burden. And the good news is that Wichita Falls enjoys one of the lowest cost of livings in the entire country, not just the state of Texas. And so yeah. we are burdened less than, than many other people all over the country. Uh, there was a question, and I, and I don't know if it was worded quite right, but there was a question about would there be a possibility that if, if necessary, this could be rethought and proposed in the spring of next year? Yes. Um, the uh, um, 2014 bond that did not pass um, was to build a, a, a large high school on the southwest side of town and then to repurpose Hershey to a smaller school and a career tech type center. Um, and that one did not pass. Um, and it, it took us six years to get to this new, um, to this new solution for that failed bond. Um, we learned from that bond we needed a CEC. Um, that our community wanted that and so that happened in 2015 and we opened up that facility in 17 but it took us this long to get to this one um, and and i think the main thing will be we would have to listen again um, hear what their community thinks hear what they said and try to determine um, what was um, something that caused us not to pass in order to go back out and and i may turn around as possible 
but um, it, it, it would be um, probably unlikely. It, it'd, it'd be really tough to make that timeline. It looks like that's the last of our questions. I'm gonna close out with this quick story. We're in the process of entertaining two different manufacturers who are considering opening plants in Wichita Falls. And a month ago, we visited with one group. Last week, we had the CEO of another company in and they both asked me, so we talk about schools and they know that this election is coming up and they both asked me, what's your plan B? School facilities and the quality of the environment that our kids go to school in are very important to companies when they're making relocation decisions. And if we want to provide the best possible Wichita Falls and attract more people to be here, we have to do something about our schools. That's the reason that the Chambers Board of Directors recently voted unanimously to endorse this proposition. And that's the why the chain, that's the why it's part, that is why it's part of our economic development strategy to sustain and grow Wichita Falls. I want to thank Superintendent Kurt and Board President Elizabeth Yeager for being here today. Thanks to everybody for your time coming out to learn more about this important issue. Please remember if you have not voted already, vote yes for new schools. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.